We welcome you to Calvary Bible Chapel on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. We pray God's richest blessing upon you as you sit under the ministry of His Word. I think this is part 27, the conquering comforter. Part 27, the conquering part comes from 1 John 4.4. 4. This is the study that we are in. Year of God, little children, and have overcome them. We are overcomers. Whether we act like it, taste like it, smell like it, feel like it, we are overcomers. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's why you are an overcomer. In our study so far, we wanted to see what an overcomer is. And so we looked at numerous portions of scripture. An overcomer is a conqueror, a prevailer. Uh, remind you of Romans 8 37 that says that we are hyper conquerors we are more than conquerors why because of who we are and what we do no through him that loved us obviously um, my burden was that we understand how to overcome in a practical way and it's gathering together being with those of like precious faith and so we are thinking of what worship looks like in 2024 so where is there a realistic account of good and bad worship in the church age obviously revelation chapters 2 and 3 why did i come to that conclusion because all of the seven churches mentioned all have the word overcomer in them Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, they all are overcomers or those who are known to Christ. Before the Lord gave a realistic account of worship, what worship looks like in the first century, he faithfully gives us many guidelines on who, how, why, where, and even when to worship. Um, the verse that I have up on the screen, 1 Timothy 3.15, but if I tarry long, Paul speaking to Timothy, he says that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. If you are focusing and trying to find how to worship from in here, you are going to fail, and you're going to fail miserably. Again, one of the messages that is coming up, I don't know when, but is coming up, who knows what perfect worship looks like? Satan knows what worship, perfect worship looks like. And so he's going to do everything in his power, because he can't take your salvation, but he can take your effectiveness in worship. And he's doing a masterful job as we thought of in our last study. So we come to the principles of public worship. I'm going to run through these very quickly. These all come from Revelation chapter 1. If you'd like to turn there, um, we will be there in just a moment. I'm going to uh, give you the first 11 up on the screen. I'm going to do this again very quickly. Just as a review, it's been a few weeks since we've reviewed. Revelation 1 1 says the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the first principle is that we in the church should see the great purpose of all things. The life itself, to know more of him and to be able to glorify him more. Continuing on in verse 1, which God gave unto, unto him, which the Father gave to, to the Son to show unto his servants things which shortly must come to pass. Sent and signified it by his angel unto the, to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So number two, we in the church should see the divine order of how God is manifesting his son. It goes the father, the son, here to an angel, and then to John, and then of course to us. Number three, blessed is he, or verse three, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Number three, the church is shown the importance of reading, hearing, and keeping the revelation, of course, the word of God. In 1 John 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So 
Principle number four, the church should understand the importance responsibility of being re the recipient of the revelation. Grace be unto you and peace. Number five, the church is blessed beyond comprehension with the facts of our favorite position in, his, in this salvation. Continuing on in verse four, from him which is, which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his thrones or his throne and from Jesus Christ so number six was the church is exhorted to see the true source of grace and peace I don't think that's number f verse five I think I've got that no no I do okay and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness first begotten of the dead the prince the kings of the earth number seven was the church is to be Centrally, centrally focused on the foundation of the finished work, his goodness of Christ's past, present, and future. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins of his, in his blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory, dominion, and power forever and ever. Amen. Verse 8, the church should observe the heart that is forever ready to praise and glorify the one whose love has accomplished all for us, past, present, and future. Staying with that thought unto him that loved us, the church is astonished in adoration because of the remembered response that man's greatest problem of separation for God was resolved by the greatest act of love and worship. More recently, now verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So number 10 was, The church is admonished to behold the place our Lord's personal return, second coming to this earth holds in Scripture as a source of rest today. Last week, the signature. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. The church hears Christ attributes, names, as a seal of authority of his lordship. So that was last week. That's just a very quick review. And so this morning, we come now to verse 9. And um, before we get to verse 9, I want you to see something. I'm, it, it may be that you realize this. It may be that this is, I can make this a little clearer for you this morning. But uh, what I want you to see is that in verse 9, we begin a new section. That verses 1 through 8 was the introduction, if you will, to the book of Revelation. And of course, remembering from last week's message in verse 8, Christ signs this introduction. I am Alpha and Omega. So in verse 9, we begin three great visions that take up the rest of the book of Revelation. So from Revelation 1-9, what we'll start this morning to chapter 4, verse 1, where the church is raptured, this is the vision... of the risen glorified Son of God judging during the present age the spiritual state of the assemblies or churches on earth as his light bearers. And uh, we will at least finish Revelation chapter 1 in this study. I don't know that we'll move and look at each one of the churches, but I want you to see this. This is big picture stuff. This is um, breaking the book of Revelation down into sections, okay? So Revelation chapter 1, 1 through 8 was the introduction. This morning we begin the vision of Christ as the glorified Son judging during our age. And of course that ends in chapter 4 verse 1 when the church is risen, uh, raptured. There are two more visions. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 talk about the throne room. And it is an amazing study to do the throne room. I do believe that that's where our works will be tried by fire. 
And I personally believe that this will happen early in the tribulation period, uh, not on earth, but in heaven as we will be raptured. But then I also want you to see in chapter 6, verse 1, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, is all one vision. A vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, returning to the earth in the great day of wrath to establish the millennial kingdom. So do you understand why I wanted to review a little bit this morning to give you kind of a big picture of there's really four sections in the book of Revelation. The one we just finished last week would have been the introduction with Christ signing the end of it. We now start the first vision for us, the church. Uh, I don't know that we'll look at the throne room vision, and I don't know that we will look entirely at the rest of the book of Revelation. But I, I wanted you to, to, to get a, an overview, a, a big picture of the book of Revelation as we begin this first vision of Christ. So now let's go to verse 9 this morning. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, number 12, this is a principle of public worship number 12. The church is exhorted to embrace the divine order that the brotherhood be partakers in tribulation, kingdom, and endurance for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. This obviously is very important because John starts off this new vision or this first vision introducing himself. I find it so interesting that he calls himself John. How many times did John call himself John? Not very many times. He would call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He very rarely would use his own name in the first person. I find it interesting because John was known to all seven of these churches. That is a blessing to me. When you think about John writing, um, if, if John walked in the room this morning, we would count ourselves to, as blessed. He is, or he was, an apostle. He's laid his head on Christ's breast and, and heard his heartbeat. He could have written to the seven churches in Asia, he could have written with much authority. He could have said, I, John, the apostle, but he doesn't. He says, I, John, who am also your brother. This is not the first time that an apostle would do this. If you want to think about uh, the book of Philemon, do you remember the book of Philemon where um, the uh, apostle Paul is writing to Philemon, the slave owner, about Onesimus, the slave? And he wants Philemon to take Onesimus back. The apostle Paul would say, wherefore I thought it might be much bold in Christ to adjoin the that which is convenient. In other words, I could have written to you as an apostle, Philemon. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't flaunt his authority. He didn't use his authority wrongfully. John obviously is not going to do the same thing. He comes to 
the churches and he says, I am your brother. I am your brother. The churches are going to be much more comfortable with what is going to be written about them and some of that is quite harsh. So I thought it was interesting. He calls himself a companion. A companion. I am your brother and companion. The word for companion means a partaker. Partaker. The Apostle Paul would use this word. He said, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. That I might be a companion with you. The tone in which this section is written in was written by a brother in love, in companionship, being a partaker. And I think that you need to, to get that. I'm, I'm sure that we've all received formal letters. Okay, some of you haven't. Formal texts, is that better? For some of you in the back row, Instagram, anything? Uh, we don't know. Yes, some of us have received letters before. But we've also received letters from family members or texts that were written in love. And I, I think you need to see the tone in which this is written. So now we come to what was John a companion in? And I want you to see the divine order here. And I got to be honest with you, when I first read this, I, I would have switched two and three. I would have said, okay, tribulation, I'll give you tribulation. John is on the Isle of Patmos. I wonder if John thought he was a failure. I wonder if John, in isolation, said, what good am I anymore? Hmm. But John says, I am your brother, I am your partaker in tribulation, in the kingdom, and then patience. And I got to be honest with you. I would have switched two and three. I would have said tribulation, patience, and then kingdom, right? Because kingdom is after kingdom. But that's not what the Word of God says, does it? And I think I know the reason why. But you're going to have to wait a few seconds for me to tell you. I've got a couple more things I want to go through. So as you see the divine order here, it starts with tribulation, doesn't it? I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation. Yikes. Well, pastor, I'm tuning you out because I don't like tribulation. I want everything to go easily, smoothly. And I understand I don't think that you should, if, if you anywhere get in this message, that you should go look for, for hard times. You're, you're, I'm not going to try to make that point. Enough times are coming. If you stand for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, they're coming. So, I'd like to start with tribulation. Here's just a brief overview in Scripture of some of the facts about tribulation. Uh, if you'd like to turn to Romans chapter 8 with me. 
Romans chapter 8. Letter A. The believer suffers because he lives in a sin-cursed world. You don't need to go looking for tribulation. You live in tribulation. Your body is uh, formed now with a curse on it. Romans chapter 8, let's start in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We'll talk about that at the end. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The believer suffers because he lives in a sin-cursed world. And not only they, but, yep, ourselves also. Which have the first fruits of the Spirit... Even we ourselves groan. Do you groan? You groan. And the older you get, the more you groan. And I'm, I think I'm going to be 55 this year, I think. And it's going to get worse, I know. So... We are waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're waiting for our new bodies. But on earth, suffering, tribulation. We do that because Adam's decision in the garden, and by the way, you somewhere along the line, somebody would have made the decision, even if Adam wouldn't have. So death came by Adam. Letter B, the believer suffers because of sin and God's chastisement. Would you like to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12? By the way, I do not believe that John was on the Isle of Patmos because of his own sin. I do not believe that God was chastising John. I believe it was for the word of God and testimony of Jesus Christ. But much of our suffering is because of our own sin, our own choices, our own consequences. So Hebrews chapter 12, let's look at verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. And what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So if you are being chastised by the Lord, or if you have experienced that in the past, and I would venture to say that all of us have, you ought to count it a privilege that you are his child. So that's what these verses are saying. Letter C, the believer suffers in order to try his faith. Lord, I don't want my faith to be tried. Let's turn to James chapter 1. The believer suffers in order to try his faith. There are times when we are not being chastised of the Lord, but because... Our faith does need to be tested. It does need to be tried. So James chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren. And I. You now I'm just going to read what the Bible. Joy. How many of you when a trial or testing or testing or suffering comes. Do we count it all Joy. Well, I don't, I'll promise you. I kick the can, my bottom lip comes out. 
That's not what the Bible commands us. It says, count it all joy. When you fall in diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Maturity. If you want to know more about Christ, one, uh, I mentioned this in uh, Bible class, the verse that we pray, and I don't want you to pray it with me, I'm just going to quote it, but do not pray this yet. But the verse says, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of, fellowship of his what? You are praying for suffering. That's why I didn't want you to pray it. But if you're going to know more about him, beloved, you got to suffer. You want to stick your head in the sand and just make it to heaven? Or do you really want to know more about him? So let her see the believer suffers in order to to try his faith. And lastly, if you'd like to turn to Romans chapter 5, letter D, the, the believer suffers in order to produce spiritual growth. You cannot grow without suffering. Why? Because we live in a sin-cursed world. Look at Romans chapter 5. We'll start in verse 3. And not only so, but we glory, there, there's that thought again, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So the next time that that hard time comes, that makes you so uncomfortable that you anything else Lord but this just get me out of this Lord you may want to consider are you chastising me for something and if not keep me in here so I can grow but that's that's a pretty serious request listen I know what my request would be anything but this Lord why? Because I'm always focused on me. Instead of whom I should be focused on. The Bible has much to say about tribulations, trials, and sufferings. So much, beloved, that I'm not going to be able to get to all of these verses this morning. I'm giving them to you realizing that um, I'm not going to be able to turn to each one of these. I would, I think, uh, like to turn to, um, uh, let's do 1 Peter 2, 19. And uh, that's really the only ones that I'm, one I'm going to look at from this top two sections. We're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 next, but uh, I, I want you to just get a feel for what the scripture says about suffering and, and uh, trials and tribulations and the consequences. So 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 19, okay? Everybody there? For this is thankworthy, oh, count it all joy, Glory? Thankworthy? Yeah, that, that is the tone that I get from John in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. John is not saying, hey, can someone feel sorry for me over here? Can someone look at me and see how bad I've got it here? That's not the picture of John. He's not complaining, beloved. He's glorying. He's thankful that he's in isolation on the Isle of Patmos. I've never had anything close to that. P 
Peter. And you remember how Peter's going to die? The Lord told him that he would be crucified. History tells us that he would not even be crucified right set up. That he requested to be crucified hanging from his feet. Peter says, For it is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Are there times that you suffer wrongfully? Maybe. Probably. Peter says, For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? If you've done something wrong. And I wonder if we could put a percentage in our life and no one, no one else would know but you. But if we could put a percentage in our life of all the things that we have to endure because of our wrong decisions. And all of the things we have to endure because of our right decisions. I wonder what the percentage would be. I, I'm glad you can't see that percentage of me. But if, middle of verse 20, when you do well, you suffer for it, take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. For even hereto were ye called. You were called to suffer not wrongfully, or not, not for your own consequences, or your, your own decisions, but you were called here on earth to go through tribulations for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you're taking a breath right now, that's what God expects of you. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We won't take the time to read all of this chapter. I've got a couple more things I want you to see this morning. But let's do read verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. That's, uh, ooh, I forgot. It's not 7 through 1. I think it's 7 through 17. Um, yes. I'm sorry. There should be, let me use my pointer here. There should be a 7 right there, okay? Tribulations. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I do want you to see the context. Paul says, therefore seeing we have this ministry. Do you have a ministry? You do. I think I told you this a few weeks ago. You being here today is a ministry. For us gathering together like this. Therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy. If there is anybody on the face of the earth who could have kicked the can, stuck his bottom lip out, and felt sorry for his ministry, it would have been the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, it's by God's mercy that I even have a ministry. What a contradiction. God, how can you give me a ministry? I don't deserve it. Or, God, how can you give me a ministry? I don't deserve it. Right? Same words. So if you go down to verse 7, Paul now, and I'll call your attention to these uh, paradoxes here, earth and vessel, power of God, dying of Jesus, life of Jesus, death working, life working. He's now going to 
these contra seemingly contradictions in the flesh. And that's what he's talking about. Look at verse 7. But we have this treasure where? In earthen vessels. What's he talking about? He's talking about our bodies. How do you feel today? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Yes, we do have earthen vessels, and yes, they are decaying. And yes, we groan. And yet Paul says, look at this, we are troubled, verse 8, on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about the body of the, uh, the dying of Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. If you look at verse 17, this is again a reoccurring theme when you think of patience. It says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. What, what, what is he talking about? A, a split second? No, a lifetime. But a lifetime, 70, 80, 85, 50, however long you live, it's just a moment compared to eternity. I found this in, uh, I think this is Worsby. Again, I don't appreciate Worsby all the time, but sometimes he just does a better job than me. So I'm going to read what he says about this portion of Scripture. The believer is simply a jar of clay. It is the treasure within the vessel that gives the vessel its value. The image of the vessel is a reoccurring theme in Scripture. To begin with, God has made us the way we are so that he can do the work he wants us to do. Paul said that I'm a chosen vessel to bear, my, to bear the Lord's name to the Gentiles. No Christian should ever complain to God because of his lack of gifts or abilities or because of his limitations or handicaps. The psalmist, Psalm 139, indicates that our very genetic structure is in the hand of God. Each of us must accept himself and be himself. The important thing about a vessel is that it be clean, empty, and available for service. Each of us must seek to become a vessel of honor. We are vessels so that God might use us. We are earthen vessels so that we might depend on God's power and not our own. We must focus on the treasure and not the vessel. Paul was not afraid of suffering or trials because he knew that God would guard the vessel so long as Paul was guarding the treasure. God permits trials. God controls trials. God uses trials for his own glory. God is glorified through weak vessels. J. Hudson Taylor said, All God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on Him being with them. Sometimes God permits our vessels to be jarred so that some of the treasures will spill out and enrich others. Suffering vessels not only um, uh, reveal, excuse me, suffering reveals not only the weakness of man but also the glory of God. Not only must we focus on the treasures and not the vessel, but we must also focus on the master and not the servant. Some excellent commentary, I believe, on that. I want to get to these last orders um, because I want you to see that kingdom and patience, I believe, are in the proper order here. What is the Lord talking about? What is John talking about when he says the kingdom? 
No? The kingdom of God, the, the millennial reign of Christ. So, um, look at uh, Acts chapter 14. I'm not going to read either, both of these, but look at Acts chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 19. Um, we have stressed for two or three weeks now the importance of looking for the kingdom of God. I want to reiterate that I do not uh, adhere to the Reformed theology understanding of Scripture. Um, I do believe that we will be raptured before the tribulation period starts and that the millennial reign of God is an actual 1,000 year reign after the tribulation period. If you believe that, you are in a great minority today. Most people believe that we're in the tribulation period now and that the millennial reign of Christ is not an actual thousand year reign. To which I greatly disagree. But we are to be looking forward to the kingdom as we've stressed in the past few weeks because that is when Christ is going to be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. That is when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Not at the rapture of the church, which I believe begin, will happen before the tribulation period starts. But look at Acts chapter 14. Let's start in verse 19, Acts 14, 19, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, I would count that as a tribulation, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city, and the next day departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, where he had just been stoned, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith that we, through a bunch of laying around and being couch potatoes, should enter into the kingdom of God. That's not what it says, right? That we must, through just a little bit of tribulation, much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So tribulation, and then kingdom. This is the divine order. So the question I hope that is in your mind is why is patience third? Shouldn't it go tribulation, endurance or patience, and then the kingdom? Because when we get to heaven, we're not going to need patience anymore. Are we? I asked my wife this question this morning. She gave me a really good answer. She was wrong, but she gave me a good answer. I asked her, when we get to heaven, will we need patience? And in my mind, before this message, I would have thought, no, I don't need patience anymore, I'm done. And the fact is, is that we're still going to have to be patient. Not, not patient. We're not going to sin when we get to heaven. I, I, I want to make that clear. That was one of her questions. We're not going to lose our patience when we get to heaven, but we're going to still need patience when we get to heaven. Why? Because there's a seven-year period called the tribulation period. And during that time, we're still going to need patience. Looking forward to the time when Christ will return. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 5. I won't read Revelation chapter 6. This isn't you. Revelation chapter 6 isn't you. It's a, a different group of saints. These are the saints that are martyred during the tribulation period, and they're under the throne. But I will 
just call your attention to the question that they ask the Lord in Revelation chapter 6. They ask the question, how long? How long? They still need patience. Not in a sinful sense. I don't believe that they will have the ability to sin. I also don't believe that they will have their glorified bodies yet. But they're asking how long? How long, Lord? But now I'm going to show you what you're going to be saying. In Revelation chapter 5, this is you and this is what you're singing. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and has made unto us our God kings and priests, and we are reigning on earth. Now, that's not what it says. It says we shall reign on earth. What tense is that? That's the future tense. That means that you still have something to be waiting for. Even in heaven, in the throne room, as the Lord Jesus opens the seals of this book and starts the uh, judgment upon the nation of Israel and the rejecting, rejecting nations, we will be in heaven still needing to wait, still needing patience, not in a sinful sense, but still needing patience. Seven years of judgment upon this earth. So as we come to a close this morning, I, I want you to think about this statement. And I believe it's very true. Ministry that costs you nothing accomplishes nothing. I read an illustration of two older pastors who were listening to a younger pastor preach the message and the younger pastor did a wonderful job but both of the older pastors said he will be more effective when he's had his heart broke and I believe that with all my heart ministry that costs you nothing accomplishes nothing Don't go looking for trials, but when they come, make sure that you are doing it for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'll read this in closing. This is in your bulletin. Viewing our afflictions in the light of eternity. This is by George Zeller. Our present afflictions often seem to be burdened a burden far too heavy to bear. Our present trials can press down very massively upon us, yet from eternity's viewpoint, our burdensome afflictions is very light compared to the enormous weight of future blessings that will be ours forever. Likewise, the trials we go through often seem endless. We cry out, Lord, how long must I endure this trial, this difficulty? It seems like it will never end, however, from eternity's viewpoint. Our point of view, the affliction lasts only for a moment, which is insignificant when compared to our future glory, which is eternal. When going through difficult, fiery trials, it is very helpful to remember that the affliction is light and temporary when seen from God's point of view. We need to reckon or count the Bible facts as true. Paul said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is no comparison. The future glory totally outweighs the present suffering and makes them insignificant by comparison. One might say it this way, on one side of the scale, you have a very insignificant particle of dust that represents the sufferings of this present time. On the other side of the scale, you have a huge piece of gold weighing a million tons, which represents the future glory. These statements by Paul 
are all the more remarkable when we consider the extent of his personal suffering. Our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to Paul's, what Paul went through. Yet none of these sufferings compare with our gargantuan future glory. Ministry that costs you nothing, accomplished nothing accomplishes nothing. May everything we did do be done for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to consider John and the Isle of Patmos writing to his brothers about the times ahead, the times that they were dealing with. Lord, we all have struggles in our lives. Many of them we've brought upon ourselves. And yet there may be some where we made a decision to stand for the word of God and for the testimony of Lord Jesus Christ and we humble ourselves that you would count us worthy to suffer as your son suffered. We praise you and we thank you for this wonderful letter, this wonderful letter written to the seven churches that are in Asia. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.